So it's my pleasure to introduce Chelsea Komlo today. Chelsea is completing her PhD at the University of Waterloo. She's also been a sci chief scientist at Zcash Foundation for a number of years. Chelsea's work is on threshold Schnorr and threshold signatures in general. Uh, she's been a co-author of uh, one of the draft standards for ITF on two-round threshold Schnorr signature. Uh, and it's very exciting to see uh, it being standardized. Hopefully, it will eventually be. Um, yep. And please welcome Chelsea. She's going to talk about her work on the Threshold Schnorr. Thank you all for having me. Uh, this title is a little misleading, so I am mostly going to be talking about my work, but I do hope to uh, highlight other people's work in the space as well. Um, so yeah, the main focus of this will be the work that I've done in the space, but I do try to kind of like highlight um, other trends and other things that people has, have done in this space. And one thing I want to emphasize is this is about um, threshold uh, signature schemes. There's also been a lot of work done on N of N or multi-signature schemes. So I'm not going to be talking about that, but there has been like very similar work and parallel work in that space. And we can talk about it, but it's not something I will be reviewing today. So I guess just a little bit about me. Um, so I like to call myself a real world cryptographer. Uh, before I went to grad school, I was actually an engineer for a number of years. And I did things like I worked on uh, encrypted, encrypted mail for Enigma. I helped contribute to the off-the-record messaging protocol, which the um, Signal protocol is based on. And I also contributed to the Tor protocol as well. Um, and in my work recently, I've been part of the Zcash Foundation, and I've helped uh, uh, contribute to informational drafts within the I ITF. And really like my experience as an engineer has influenced how I do research and it influences um, what I design and the decisions I make in uh, the protocols that I work on. So really whenever I do research, my main focus is thinking about like what would be easy to implement, what would people want to implement, and what is a good user experience. And I try to use that as like my um, North Star, I guess, when I'm working on cryptography. And um, so yeah, overall, this is about uh, threshold Schnorr signatures, but I would love to collaborate and I am really excited to be here and learn about what everyone else is working on as well. A lot of work I've been doing right now is on threshold Schnorr, so it's kind of been uh, a wave, but it's something I'm, uh, I'm now starting to look into other areas beyond just threshold Schnorr. So I know many of you here are familiar with threshold signatures and threshold Schnorr signatures. Um, but maybe can I just get a hand for people who are working on like the economics side of things or consensus or formal verification? So, okay, good, this is helpful. So I do have a fair amount of background in this talk. Um, for many of you, this will be a little boring. I try to have like things that are not boring to those of you who are, are in the space, um, but I will go through some background um, for those of you who are not familiar with, with this work. So just to recap um, what a threshold signature is, so it's a public-private scheme where similar to a single party signature, you have one public key that represents a group, but then you have some set of parties, each which hold a secret share. And we generally say that it's a T out of N scheme. So here I'm showing a, a two out of three setting where you need at least two parties to participate in signing in order to issue a signature. And key generation, it can either be done by a trusted dealer or a distributed key generation protocol. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. What's nice about these schemes is they allow for some kind of distribution of trust and uh, utility in the case of failure. So even if one party were to be corrupted, the security of the scheme would still remain secure. And that's something we, we really like about these primitives. Another thing that's nice is when signing is being performed, secret key material doesn't need to be sent around to other parties. Secret key material can remain local, and oftentimes you can use a public channel in order to perform signing. There are a lot of applications for threshold signatures. Most of them are in the blockchain space, but something I'm hopeful to see in the future are things like adoption for certificate authorities. And that was actually one of the original uh, motivating examples of threshold signatures is having something like a certificate authority, which um, is used in the web PKI, be able to issue signatures. It's 
really interesting how quickly threshold signatures are being adopted, but I do think there's like real practical interest in threshold signatures. And one example I like to give of where they would have been useful is in the Mt. Gox example. So if you're not familiar with Mt. Gox, it was an exchange and all of users' assets were maintained in one wallet, and then the assets were later to be stolen. So um, threshold signatures really are a tool in order to distribute trust, in order to ensure um, basically like any kind of authorized action over some kind of valuable asset. So I do like to have like real world motivating examples of where we might use these things. Again, it's not just like cryptographers trying to sell people on their work. Uh, there has been a call by NIST to, it's not a standard yet, but they're asking for submissions of threshold signature schemes. Th we, we can think about it more as like an open call for NIST to see what schemes exist out there. Right now, they're working with cryptographers and we're in the process of submitting one of our schemes. And then hopefully in the future, we'll eventually see some kind of standard. But hopefully there's a lot more development in the space and then we'll actually start to see some codified standards in the future. I've been talking about threshold signatures and their security. And now I'll, I'll define that a little bit more uh, precisely. So when we say a threshold signature scheme is secure, one of the main things that we talk about is the notion of unforgeability. So we want to make sure that some adversary can't forge a signature. That's pretty intuitive. That's something that we would say for any kind of signature scheme. Another thing we need to think about for threshold signature schemes is the notion of liveness. So basically, if you do want to create a signature, the system is able to do so. And I do think liveness is sometimes lost when we talk about threshold signatures, um, but both notions are, are quite important. So even if you had a scheme that uh, an adversary wouldn't be able to forge a signature, if they were able to prevent funds from being used, then that's, that's also an attack we need to think about. And then one more terminology I'd like to throw in there is the notion of robustness. I just told you about liveness. Basically, robustness is a technical term that we use to say that the protocol should be able to succeed as long as T players participate honestly. So it's basically a technique that we use in order to achieve liveness. Um, I'll use this term later in the talk, but it's something that I just want to say it's a, it's a means to an end in order to achieve liveness. So I'm going to show you uh, an unforgeability experiment, and this should look similar to what you would see for a normal signature scheme with a slight twist in that the adversary is able to participate in the protocol. So basically we say a threshold signature scheme is secure uh, as long as the adversary can't output some forgery. That forgery means that the message was not queried to any of the honest signers, and the signature is valid with respect to some public key. The main difference in this experiment is that the adversary is able to determine which of the parties are corrupt, and then it's able to receive secret keys for any of the parties which it chooses, as long as the corruption is within some threshold. Here, I'm just modeling unforgeability by key generation happening by some centralized party. Uh, you can also model this using a DKG. You can model the DKG in the experiment. Um, but here I'm just showing key gen as being uh, done by the experiment itself. And then yeah, throughout the experiment, the adversary can interact with honest parties. It can query any of these signing oracles on messages of its choosing. And then the win condition, as I said, is that it should be able to output some forgery. So this is a game-based definition of unforgeability. I know, uh, I think Yehuda tomorrow will be talking about simulation-based notions, but uh, here I'm modeling this as a game. And like I said, the adversary is allowed to participate as a signer. Okay, so now I'm going to remind you all what Schnorr signatures are, just really briefly. So a Schnorr signature scheme is just uh, a zero-knowledge proof of knowledge that's bound to the message via the fiat Shamir transform. So for Schnorr, it's very simple. Uh, we generate a key pair, so it's just some secret key, and the public key is the generator raised to that secret key. To sign the message, we sample the nonce at random, and then we generate the commitment, which is just the generator raised to that nonce. Challenge is the hash of the public key message and commitment, and then the response is the nonce added together with the challenge and secret key. And then for verification, the verifier rederives the challenge, and then they just check in the exponent that this relation holds. So the verifier receives the public commitment R, um, the public key, and the challenge, and then they check that in the exponent Z uh, satisfies this relation for the committed values. Do you know okay. exactly what Schnorr patented about this idea? That is a really good question. <laughs> um, 
Is it actually folklore? Did he patent something? He, he definitely patented it. So um, I don't know if it's proof of knowledge. It, it might have been how the nonce is used, given how the structure of ECDSA is different. Um, so if I had to guess, it had to, it must have been this like linear check, given how like ECDSA, you don't have that same linearity. Um, but I've not looked at this. I guess, sorry, to repeat the question for those on Zoom, uh, the question is, do we actually know uh, what Schnorr patented in terms of this check? Okay, so um, yeah, so I just reminded you what Schnorr is. So the main challenge when you're designing multi-party Schnorr signatures, there's actually two. So the first challenge is how you actually share this nonce. And the second challenge is how you share the secret key. And when you look at these different types of schemes, the differences between the schemes really comes down to the strategies that they take for these two different questions. Um, I'm not gonna focus too much on how the secret key is shared. I'm gonna focus more on how the nonce is shared and I'll just show you one strategy for how the secret key could be shared. One strategy, again, for those of you who are familiar with Shamir, you can, you can tune out for this, but for those of you who are not, Basically, uh, what you could do for sharing the secret key is you can generate a polynomial where this uh, constant term is the secret key. Each party will then just get a point on that polynomial associated with their identifier, and the public key will just be the generator raised to the secret key, and each party will get their secret key share where that share is a point on the polynomial and the public key. So. Right here, I'm just showing you plain Shamir secret sharing, but where the public key uh, is the generator raised to this constant term. And this is used in many of the schemes that I will talk to you about. And then just so all of us have notation, uh, later I will show you this implicitly, but to recover the secret key, we just do polynomial interpolation where this uh, lambda i is the Lagrange coefficient. So just to interpolate, we take at least uh, t plus one points and we use Lagrange interpolation to interpolate to the secret key. So I just showed you how you can do key generation in a centralized manner. You can do all of this using a DKG. I'm not going to show you how to do that, but it is uh, something that we can do and we can talk about it more later if you'd like. Basically the main difference with the DKG is no party knows the corresponding secret key. Okay, so that's background for those of you who are not familiar with this area of work. So I'm going to talk to you about the past. A question I have gotten quite a lot, or at least I used to get, is why are we looking at multi-party Schnorr signatures now? And I think that's a really valid question to ask given that Schnorr signatures have been around for a long time. And I think like some people have said, well, Schnorr signatures have been around for a long time. Why don't we have good multi-party Schnorr signatures now? And um, something that Avi said that I want to highlight is that well, here, this is actually where we're running into the issue of patents. Schnorr published his paper in 1990, and I, we believe the patent came out in 1991. And really, this delayed a lot of research in this area, and it is the reason why we have ECDSA. And I really like to highlight this because it seems like a lot of people who are newer in the space don't actually know why we have ECDSA, and the they don't really fully appreciate, I think, the complexity that ECDSA introduced into the ecosystem. So I do want to highlight the fact that it is because of a patent. Um, and yeah, now we're just starting to see the reemergence of Schnorr. And that's why a lot of the research that we've done recently, which you know could have been discovered a long time ago, I think was just, no one was really paying attention to the space. So, but I think a lot of the reason people are paying attention to this now as well is because um, Right, because uh, Bitcoin is starting to move, or I think they have moved to Schnorr signatures, and then we also have something like the NIST draft. So we are starting to see a lot more interest and emergence in this space. Another thing I wanna highlight is like, something that is said about Schnorr signatures is that they're easy, like, and it's an easier quote unquote problem than ECDSA. And so I'm gonna show you a first attempt of how you might design a Schnorr signature. And this attempt like was done in the literature, like myself and my co-authors have made a mistake with this first attempt and it's easy to do. And then we'll look at the fixes that were developed around this attempt. Okay, so a first attempt of how you might design a Schnorr signature, uh, a multi-party threshold Schnorr signature is you might uh, generate the nonce. So each party might generate the nonce and the commitment, and then they would send all of the commitments to each party and then they would receive commitments from each party. And then the 
group commitment would just be the product of everyone's commitments. Okay, so super simple. The challenge would be the same as in single party Schnorr. And then the response would look very similar to as in single party Schnorr. So you'd have your nonce, challenge, secret key, but then we would actually additionally add this Lagrange coefficient into this relation. Then all parties would output what I'm gonna call signature shares. And to combine, uh, to get the actual output response Z, you would just sum all of the signature shares and then the signature would be this uh, group commitment R along with the response Z. And this would satisfy, this signature would be valid under the Schnorr relation check. This scheme is secure in a sequential setting. So if you were issuing one signature at a time, this scheme would be secure. But what's interesting is it's actually not secure in a concurrent setting. And I think this comes down to the question of security proofs and how do we model security proofs and concurrency. There's proofs in the literature that only considered sequential security and didn't think about concurrent security. And so this bug uh, was not actually caught for a long time. What I mean by concurrent security is that you have some adversary which is able to perform the first round of signing many times, and it's able to get many of these commitments before it decides which uh, signing sessions to complete. And in doing that, it's able to lead to a one more forgery attack. This attack not only influences threshold signatures, it also impacts multi-signatures and blind signatures as well. So this kind of uh, concurrency attack where the signature is linear does come up quite a lot, not just in threshold schnorr, but in uh, other linear type signature schemes as well. Basically, the overall strategy to this attack is that the adversary needs to be able to query honest parties for their commitments before revealing its own commitment. So this is like one thing that's necessary for this attack to go through. I guess I'll just kind of show this. I had some more detailed notes, but I'll just show this to you in more detail. So really for uh, what I'm referring to here is the Ross attack. And what the challenge to the adversary is, is given L signing sessions, the challenge to the adversary is to find some challenge C star such that C star is the sum of challenges from valid signing sessions. And this looks a little intuitive. You would think that this would be hard to do, um, but this is the Ross problem and it's been proved that it's actually not hard. So the, you can solve this problem in time relative to the number of open signing queries that are allowed. Okay, so, right. So basically that's, that's what our one more forgery adversary has to do. And we know that they can do that with the scheme that I just showed you. Okay, so, since, so that was the past. Um, so two main approaches in the literature have emerged of how to fix this problem. So one technique to fix this problem is to force the adversary to commit to its contributions. That's like, I would say approach number one. And approach number two is to tweak, essentially tweak the signature after the fact. And we'll look at both of these approaches next. So now I'm gonna to talk to you about, I guess, the present and where some of the current literature lies today. So this first solution, force adversary to commit to its contributions, it is exactly what you'd expect. So we can take that scheme that we just looked at, and again, each party generates its nonce, its commitment, but then it generates essentially a hiding and binding commitment to its commitment. So here you could just hash the nonce, the message, and the signing set, and then each party will issue this commitment to all other parties. So they're not actually revealing their RI, they're revealing a commitment to it. They receive it from everyone else, and then they open, and receive the openings from everyone else, okay? So this is just a plain commit open protocol. Um, here I'm showing you some work. Uh, so this reflects a scheme that I worked on called Sparkle. Similar techniques have been used in a scheme called Zero S, um, a scheme by Yehuda in uh, a couple years ago and a scheme by Musig before then. So why does S need to be included in that hash? Yes, that is a is good- Is that a technical, there's an issue for that? Or yes. is it like a session ID? Um, we needed it for the simulation, um, basically to- Distinguish which session? But I mean, if you had a session yeah. ID, wouldn't that be enough? Because, so at least for the way we proved security, you need to program. And if you didn't know uh, the S and you only had the message, 
then the adversary could query across different messages, but different signing sets. And, and so the, the commitment R would change, for example. No, uh, yeah, so I know. So what mm -hmm. you just said there sounds like if you just had a session ID for mm -hmm. each signing session. Oh, sorry. Then that would be suffice, that would suffice to distinguish essentially the different. <laughs> that, yeah, I think that could, that could work. Um, in general, my, the feedback I've heard from engineers is that session identifiers are hard to enforce. So here, instead of using session identifiers, we use the message and signing set. Um, it is true that, yeah, with like a unique counter, you could probably get around that. Um, when I've talked about session IDs with engineers, there's generally the question of like, how do you enforce consistency? How do you- But doesn't make... the adversary, the adversary can create several sessions with the same set, right? Mm -hmm. And somehow you don't have to, you don't need a different Oracle to program from the. It's the, it's the combination of the message signing set and the nonce and all of those things together we're able to, to simulate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can, I can go over the proof. I don't go over the proof in too much detail here, but there are, there are differences in when the message and signing set are sent. So in some proofs, you can send it in the first round. For adaptive security, we had to send it in the first round. If you have static security, you could only send it in the second round, for example. So basically with the scheme, it is nearly identical to what I showed you. However, we just have this commit and open strategy, okay? And so with this, we're able to get concurrent security. So basically, this is a secure scheme. It does have three online rounds, and it's not robust. So it is a step up from what I just showed you, but there's some disadvantages as well. The next strategy you could do, so if you don't want a commit reveal strategy, the next strategy that you could do is essentially use a tweak. We know how to describe this now after <laughs> we designed Frost, but when we designed Frost, we didn't actually understand that's what we were doing. But really, like this is a strategy to tweak the signature in a way that the adversary doesn't have control. So basically for Frost, what we do is instead of generating one nonce, we generate two nonces and then we generate two commitments to those two nonces. Then uh, instead of committing to those nonces and revealing them, we send those commitments directly in the clear and we receive them from everyone else. So essentially you're just sending tuples around. Then each party uh, derives a hash of the public key message, uh, the commitments from everyone, and then this I in this tuple here is the identifier. So you're also hashing in essentially the signing set. So really what you're doing here is you're hashing in everything that was in the transcript of the first round. The commitment is then the combination of each party's commitments in conjunction with this hash, which serves as the tweak. And then you derive the challenge in exactly the same way as single party schnorr. And then the response uses both of these nonces in conjunction with this tweak. Uh, and again, the challenge, secret key, and the Lagrange coefficient. Combining and verifying is, again, exactly the same. So we just sum everything up, and then the uh, verification is the same as in single-party Schnorr. So in talking to engineers about the scheme, the reason why they like it, so the reason why it's appealing to them, uh, there's a, f a few things that they like over other schemes. One, uh, the first round can be batched. So I do know of implementations that do batch the first round. Um, another thing that they like is the fact that the first signing round is agnostic to the message in the signing set. So you could start the first round if someone doesn't reply or, I don't know, maybe one party has run out of nonces. You don't need to restart the protocol at all. You can just continue forward with whoever is available. So these types of uh, features actually differ between some of the other signature schemes. And so I just want to call that out as something that is desirable in practice. So, so this requires maintaining state across signing sessions, right? Yes. So that's, uh, I feel, is it okay or I don't know what sorts of it? We will actually get there. <laughs> yes, so yeah, um, yeah, that is a great, so I'll repeat the question. The question is, or the comment actually is that this requires persisting state between signing sessions. Is that okay? And I think ideally, no. So I think, um, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, but ideally that we wouldn't have that state. So it is used now, but it's not something that I guess is necessarily desirable. So I, I, yeah. I'm assuming you'll talk about it, but how does this get around the, this uh, ROS attacks? Like what's the intuition? Yes, um, that is that is interesting. Um, 
I don't actually, so the intuition is a little hard to think about. Um, I guess some intuition is whenever C changes, whenever whatever goes into C changes, uh, this A also has to change. So everything that's in this challenge, the public key are in the message. If the adversary were to say like, try another set of commitments, this A completely changes. And I think it's that interplay between these two that like intuitively means that it's secure. So in the scheme that I showed you before where it's just um, R plus C times the secret key times Lambda, the adversary would be able to essentially take the honest party's commitments and then try its own commitments in a way that wouldn't actually change the honest party's signature except for the C. So, yeah. so R depends yeah. on the message here. The big R, the, the nonce that's used for signing isn't fixed. The message depends, changes depends it, I guess. Message. That's one like very syntactic difference. Okay. Hmm. So adversity yeah. cannot, uh, cannot so you see like the R is R1, RI times SI to the A, and yes. A is a hash that includes a message. Yes. So the previous thing you could basically, the adversary could start a bunch of sessions and have all the R's listed. Mm -hmm. and now those are fixed and now you can mess around and pick messages. Okay. Ah, I see. <clears throat> okay. So basically the R, uh, the, you can pre-compute the R's, the RIs and the SIs, but then what gets used is actually message dependent and therefore there's no way to sort of use that up <coughs> in an attack. Yeah. I see. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have like a formal argument for that. Like the proof, we have a proof and it goes through. Um, so I, I can talk about the proof. Um, we're trying to formalize what this intuition actually is. It comes up in other areas. So like, for example, right now we're trying to prove the adaptive security of Frost and we need other proof techniques. Basically, we, we need a straight line proof technique. And with that, we actually do need something more rigorous than when the C changes, the A changes. Um, so, but it, it's like a funny thing. I think uh, we're, we're working on trying to formalize this more right now. So yeah, so I guess like, nice. So we have something that's two rounds. Uh, it solves a concurrency problem, but it's not robust. So that's one of the downsides of Frost and one of uh, the reasons that have led to some of the work that I'll be talking about next. I can talk about the security proof a little, but just sort of highlighting how these schemes differ from each other. So the commit reveal protocols have three signing rounds, but they're also able to be proven secure under more standard assumptions. So um, Yehuda's scheme is proven under Schnorr with aborts under simulation-based notion. And then we prove Sparkle, which is a three round scheme under discrete log in the random Oracle model. Uh, for Frost and its variants, we need an interactive assumption. So we do need what's called the one more discrete logarithm assumption, which is an interactive, which is an interactive assumption. Uh, I will talk about the lower half in the next few slides. So just to kind of like show you this reduction, I'll talk about it very briefly. So, and I'm showing here this A. Uh, so this is algebraic one more discrete log. In the, when we first wrote the proofs, we wrote the proofs under the one more discrete log, which is a non-falsifiable assumption. The algebraic one more discrete logarithm assumption is weaker. Um, and so in our submission to NIST, we're writing the proof under AOMDL. So this is a work in progress. But basically the way the proof works is your reduction gets L plus one discrete logarithm challenges. And the goal for it is to return L plus one discrete logarithm solutions. But you also have access to this discrete logarithm oracle. So you're able to query this oracle on a group element and receive uh, essentially the, the discrete log of, of your query. And for our reduction, we use that oracle in order to simulate signing. So that's how we're able to simulate two round signing by using this discrete log oracle. We haven't written an impossibility result that you need interactivity in order to have this two, this like two round proof. But I think, I suspect there's an impossibility result, but I haven't gotten there. So yeah, so basically that's how we use this interactive assumption is to simulate signing. Can yes. you go back two slides? 
when you said it was one offline and one online, mm-hmm. uh, is, isn't this like the first two messages are completely independent of the, uh, so that's what you mean? The so yeah, so you could perform this first message in a batched manner. So you could send out many, many commitments <laughs> at once and it's not associated with any message or signing set. Okay, so, so. This, so my question is about yeah. what applications where that works out. So mm-hmm. in practice, all of these will be different servers and when you have to sign, you know, some server will get the message and have to distribute it to all the other signers anyway. Mm-hmm. So that's like, signing is always going to be like, first you need to send a message to all the servers and then all mm-hmm. the servers send something back and maybe that central party can reconstruct a signature now. Mm-hmm. So it's always two rounds. Um, you could always send this first round in a batch and then the- no, I understand that, right? Yeah. So the first two, yeah. So everybody <gasps> sends some message in batch, that's great. So this, and then you output the signature share. So that's the However, t- like in practice, so mm-hmm. if you do the batching, we mm-hmm. all have distributed that first message. Mm-hmm. Now I need to know the signature and I don't know it. So, and in principle in any, in me, any real Me being the system, signer? The, 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 yeah, the, the threshold parties. Uh, why do they need to know the output signature? No, they need to know the message. Uh, the message can come in the second, in this part, in this round here. So I would get, oh, sorry, this is, this is a typo. Um, I should have, so in this, second arrow, I can receive commitments from everyone else and the message. So the message doesn't need to be known until after, at the same time as I receive commitments from everyone else. So i.e. when I'm generating my nonces, I don't need to know the message. No, no, I totally understand that. Okay. The, so the first step is before any of us know the message, we yes. all send our R1 messages. And that back and forth is really just everybody broadcasting to everybody else R1S1, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, but now in any system, now we're all waiting mm-hmm. around for the message. Mm-hmm. Presumably it's like some one central server gets the message that needs to be signed because some user has requested some signing. Mm-hmm. Then that central server mm-hmm. has to broadcast to everybody this A, and then mm-hmm. everybody then responds to that. So like what I'm saying is the modeling of this, the, the, the thing that you need mm-hmm. is not a one-line offline signing, mm-hmm. but actually in practice you're always going to use two offline messages. Two. Sorry, two online messages. The first mm-hmm. is I need to receive the message because I don't know it, and then I have to respond to something. So it's exactly what you said. In that message, when I receive the message, mm-hmm. presumably I can also receive something from at least the central machine, the central mm-hmm. signing thing, mm-hmm. and then I have to respond. So the optimal threshold mm-hmm. signing should be something. You have an offline message, mm-hmm. and then you receive something online, mm-hmm. and then you send something back, and the, that one party can reconstruct. So the way that I think this is used in practice is there's a central coordinator. Yeah, coordinator. Okay, so the coordinator will query parties for all of their commitments, and then the coordinator receives the message to be signed. Oh, oh, I see, okay, mm-hmm. right. So it's the not co- all to all. Essentially no. that diagram is everybody yes. sends their R1S1 to the coordinator. Yes, sorry, yes. The coordinator then <laughs> sends one message to all the parties after it knows A, uh, yes. the message. Yes. Uh, and then everybody responds to the coordinator. Yes. Okay, but still that's three exchange, or that's like one, two, three, right? Yeah, I, I don't show the coordinator here. Oh, I so think, it's not yeah. really batch, wait. Yeah, I, I can draw it out. Basically, the way that I think this is used in practice is you have many signers and you have like a central server, which is a coordinator. Um, the coordinator orchestrates the first round where all parties publish their nonces to that coordinator. The coordinator has some message sent to them. You can think of it as like an orchestration server. The coordinator has a message sent to them and then the coordinator takes that message and the commitments it's received and it orchestrates the second round. Then it performs the aggregation itself and it outputs the signature. Okay, so, so. the way I count that is one offline message because everybody sends their R1S1 to the coordinator. Mm-hmm. Then first online message is coordinator sends M to all the parties. Mm-hmm. And then second online message is everybody sends a message back to the coordinator. But that's three mm-hmm. rounds in total, one offline and two online. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, we, that, that same logic would apply to all of the other schemes I'm I talking totally about agree. as well. I okay. totally agree, but okay. I'm saying, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> is there yeah. a model in which that your protocol is actually mm-hmm. better? It's actually one online and somehow magically, if everybody, if there was a 
situation in which you knew what the message had to be signed, then mm -hmm. it would only be two messages. But I can't think of oh. something in practice where that can actually lead to a benefit. Yeah. That's my question. I'm not sure, but I would love to talk about it. So, um, yeah, it's true. We didn't really kind of, yeah, thinking about like the external architecture of like how I'm doing like the simple modeling here, but it's true that maybe there's other architectures where and other use cases where it'd be more efficient. The thing is you, you pay, so you mm -hmm. have this nice feature, which is mm -hmm. it's only one message online. Mm -hmm. However, you pay for it with this one more discrete log, which I suspect you're right. There's no way around that if you're only gonna have a one message reconstruction protocol. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. You mm -hmm. pay for that and then can you think of a situation where that wins out? Yeah, well, I, I think practice, so I can kind of at least highlight practically where people do seem to want to use this and like it is useful for them. So yeah, so I guess kind of like continuing where we are in the present. So uh, as I told you, we've written, uh, this is an informational draft for Frost. It is not a standard. Um, so yeah, so we have this informational draft for Frost. We started, let's see, in 2021 and it's gone through 12 versions since then. Um, and we're finally almost done. So for any of you who are interested in standardizing your cryptography, it takes years and many iterations, but you do eventually arrive at the end. So we've finally almost completed this saga. Chelsea, can, yes. can you talk a little bit about the process, like how it looks like and what's involved? Yeah, so, um, so myself and my co-author Ian did contribute to this. We didn't just like throw it over the wall to engineers. Um, we, we helped. Uh, write this draft. Um, but basically it was us and then like working with engineers to take everything that was in the paper and codify it in a way that's uh, more specific. So we have everything, I didn't write this part of the draft, but there's things like cipher suites in there, how you hash, uh, basically like the order of hashing, like, I don't know, diagram, like more in-depth diagrams basically. Um, so for CFRG, they're a little less strict about what goes into it. Right now we're working on the NIST draft and that, that requires a lot more effort and in-depth kind of analysis. But for this, it's, much, it's basically so that an engineer could take this and implement without having any questions about how to do so. And what goes next uh, when, you, when the draft is ready, uh, you submit it for review or you participate in meetings where voting is happening? Yeah, so we, we just over. got the final review, so it should be published as an informational draft soon. Um, but it, I think it went through like 10 different rounds of review, so it, it took a while. I guess in conjunction, uh, the Zcash Foundation has written their own specification about how they use Frost in practice. And so they've implemented Frost, and now they're starting to work on developing wallets that use Frost and starting to use it within the ecosystem. I want to highlight really quickly the team we have for Nest. And I guess like one thing I kind of want to say in terms of what I've learned as someone who worked on the initial protocol and then has like worked on standards since then and had people use it in practice. And like the one thing I really want to emphasize is this is not a one or two person effort. A lot of people have contributed both like in the follow-up papers on Frost who have looked at the protocol and helped uh, form, like even better formalize the security proof and notions. And, um, and like right now we have a lot of people on our NIST submission team spanning many different organizations. So I think something I just want to say in reflection is like, it's fun to write papers, but really to like build and deploy cryptography for the long run. It's been a lot of like building community, working with people who are, you know, experts also in the field and kind of building a coalition. And that's something I think we've, we've done pretty well. And this is, this is very much like a team effort. So I just wanna highlight some of the people on the team who have been contributing and helping lead to this as well. So this is a fun slide. Uh, so this is where I know Frost is being used in practice. Uh, every once in a while I like go to GitHub and I you know, try to find repositories that use it. There are people who have, or organizations that I know that use it internally that I can't talk about, which is unfortunate. Um, but yeah, but we know it's being used in practice. So like one thing is called FrostSnap. So they're developing hardware, basically like hardware backed wallets and um, they're using Frost. So um, Frost is deployed on a satellite for CryptoSat, which is kind of fun. They like the low latency for Frost. Um, I can actually show- So that's where they need it, but it's, that's where they need- 
So they do two party and that makes it such that they can do one. They have basically, yeah, it's two of two and that's how they can have the one two flow. And I can write that out later how they do it. But yeah, for them, uh, one round is, is very important. Okay, um, so yeah, so it's been really fun to watch um, this being moved into practice and I guess like working with so many people and helping uh, arrive at that goal. What I wanna do now is I actually wanna highlight some open problems or things that are developing in this field that I think are really promising. So a lot of this is not my work, <laughs> so I will do my best to talk about it. Um, but really I just want to tell you some of the things that are happening in threshold Schnorr signatures that I think are exciting and that I think will further continue to move the needle in, in how usable these schemes are. So I basically told you um, a lot of the schemes I just showed you are not robust and robustness is very important for the notion of liveness. And so especially in settings where you have a lot of servers or you need liveness in order to do something like consensus, um, having robust schemes is very important. There's been some really interesting work in making uh, threshold Schnorr signatures robust. So one scheme that's been worked on is a scheme called Roast. So it's basically just a wrapper to Frost and it runs like simultaneous signing sessions using Frost. But some more recent work that I think is really interesting is a protocol called Sprint. So Sprint essentially allows for performing many signing sessions in batch. What's been shown is that if you use the frost technique of essentially using these two random nonces, you're able to get uh, concurrent security. So I think you can either use frost or you can use a randomness beacon, but if you don't wanna use a randomness beacon, basically the two nonce trick plus sprint allows for concurrent security of performing many signatures in parallel. So yeah, I just want to kind of like quickly highlight some work that is being done that I think is promising. And um, it, would, it would be interesting to see like how much more performant these schemes could be. Another thing that I think is important, but is a hard problem that doesn't have a really clear solution is the idea of statelessness. So the schemes that I showed you before are randomized. So they require every party to keep state in between these signing rounds. And something that would be quite useful as a countermeasure is instead having deterministic schemes that doesn't require this kind of state keeping. So just to like motivate statelessness a little bit more. So for, yeah, as I basically told you for something like Frost, all party sample randomness at the beginning of the protocol and then they have to per persist that state all the way to the end, and the state is very sensitive. So key recovery attacks are possible if the state is reused, for example. So it's very important that the state is persisted carefully and correctly. And for engineers, that means you require locks and careful deletion, and that's like a hard thing to do in practice. There has been some work done in stateless signatures, and I'm going to talk about some work that I did recently. There's other work that has been done as well, and I would sort of characterize it in terms of efficiency. Um, so there's some schemes that, yeah, I guess I would characterize as a little less efficient that have used SNARKs or uh, generic MPC. And then there's some work that I did recently that doesn't use either of those, but there's a trade-off in that it requires honest majority. So in this landscape of what we have for uh, stateless signatures, I, I do think that there's kind of an unsolved problem about uh, what is the ideal scheme without having to make some of these trade-offs. So what's your, uh, what's your vertical axis? What's on the left and on the right versus on the right? Oh, sorry, so randomized and stateless, sorry. Yeah, so just to show you, like there's been a lot of work done on the randomized side but on the stateless side, there's not quite so many. And I think um, hopefully we see more. Actually, this has been done in practice. So I, I'm gonna show you an attack. And this is actually someone who's an auditor told me that they had seen it. So it's kind of fun to highlight. So one thing you might say is, well, why don't we just take something like Frost and make it stateless by using this threshold EDDSA trick. And basically what this trick is, is instead of generating the nonce at random, you hash the message in the secret key. And we use this for threshold EDDSA in order to prevent issues from bad randomness. But one question you can say is like, okay, why don't we just take something like Frost and generate the nonce in this way? 
But yeah, we can't do that because it is insecure to do so. And the overall intuition is that basically the adversary can deviate from their protocol and it can pick its nonce at random and it will lead to a key recovery attack. Yeah, so it's fun to say this because like implementers have done this. <laughs> so I like, I try to get the, the good word out. And I guess just like running through the way this attack would work for those of you that are interested, the way the attack works is you have a corrupt party and they would just run the first signing session honestly. So they would participate in the signing session without deviating from the protocol. And then in the second signing session, they would just, all they need to do is they just need to sample their nonce at random. So that's all that's needed for the attack to go through. The reason why is because their commitment will then deviate from the first signing session and the honest party can't actually detect that the first party has deviated from the protocol. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to recover the secret key in as little as two signing sessions. So I think the, the question is, can we build an efficient and deterministic threshold signature scheme? I think we did that partially with some work recently that I did that's called Arctic. Uh, the trade-off is that it requires honest majority. So in some settings, I think this might be a useful protocol, but there is an open question of how do you get something that is as simple and efficient in the honest minority setting. Basically for Arctic, we use something that we call a verifiable pseudorandom secret sharing scheme. Um, the pseudorandom secret sharing scheme is a known trick in the literature that has existed since 2005. And we just use a simple trick to make it verifiable. This is where the honest majority assumption comes in. But really all it does is we use this VPSS to derive the nonce and the commitment and then because it's stateless, we don't need to remember the nonce and commitment through the next round. Basically the VPSS just verifies that all of the party's commitments are consistent and then it can re-derive the commitment uh, with respect to the message and signing set and their secret key. And then the group commitment is the commitments from everyone in conjunction with the Lagrange coefficient. The challenge again is the same as in single party Schnorr and the signature is similar to what I showed you before. So it's just the nonce challenge and the secret key. The only difference from what I showed you before is the Lagrange coefficient is added to the signature share across both the nonce and the secret key. So I think Arctic is nice in that it's uh, simple and it's fast for small numbers of parties, but there is some remaining research to be done here. Does it, if you go back one slide, in that but, attack? Yes. So if you just make the protocol when you send your R1, uh -huh. let's say you can use any external snark to prove mm -hmm. that essentially R1, uh, oh, I see. It's a pretty big statement. Okay. Yeah, so um, there's a scheme, Music DN, that uses snarks to prove, um, yeah, to basically prove that the nonce is generated correctly. That would solve it? There's no other attack? Let me take a step back. Um, so they use a, uh, a snark to prove that some deterministic function was evaluated in order to generate their nonce. So like the trivial ways you, you could do the EDDSA trick where you hash um, your secret key and message and then you could use a generic snark to prove that you generated your nonce correctly. And so that works, that, that's stateless and also- Yes robust against n minus one. Yes, so the idea is like, how do you do better than that? Something that I think is interesting is basically what I showed you. So Arctic is very fast for a small number of parties. And then there's some crossover point as the number of parties grows. So essentially snarks has a crossover point with the techniques that I just showed you. So for a large number of parties, using a snark is probably better. For a small number of parties, using the VPSS trick might be better. So that's kind of the tour of uh, where we came from with Threshold Schnorr, a lot of the work that has been going on and some things that I think are really interesting that will make the deployment of Threshold Schnorr signatures even easier and hopefully solve uh, other real world problems. So the main takeaway that I think is important to know is Threshold signatures are a useful mechanism and especially when you want to think about distributing authorization. Randomized Threshold signatures are in use today and they're undergoing standardization. So stay tuned for that. And I think a lot more work, like hopefully we'll start to see 
threshold signatures deployed everywhere. But I think robustness and statelessness, they are obviously very desirable properties, but they're harder to achieve. And we're starting to see some really nice research in this area and hopefully more in the future. Again, stay tuned. There's been a lot of work done and hopefully we'll see more. A good question. Yeah. Uh, curious if you looked at the prevalence of Schnorr signatures in Bitcoin. Do people start using it more or still stick to ECDSA, you know? Yeah. Um, what I've heard is a lot of engineers want it to be used. So, sorry, the question is, um, have, like, do I understand how the transition to using Schnorr in Bitcoin has been used or like how's it, how it is going? And I personally don't know, but I know a lot of people want it just because deploying threshold Schnorr signatures is easier. Um, but I think the not, it's not going as fast as I think we want. But for other people, other people who are in the space might know as well. So Bitcoin community is very, very conservative. They don't want to change anything. Any change to Bitcoin is very, very, very slow. It's a very different culture to the Ethereum. But still, they now support Schnorr as well, yeah. together with ECDSA. So mm -hmm. they, they now should support Schnorr signatures Slowly. transaction. David. If they were conservative, then they would be using Schnorr to begin with. Conservative in a different sense, not in our, <laughs> not in our, not in our notion of conservative. <laughs> Bitcoin, Bitcoin, hardcore Bitcoin people don't want to change that. Mm -hmm. Thank you.